Opening Credits, Counterfeit, The Dre Owen Story, written by Amir Dozier, recorded at AOE Recording Studios in Fort Worth, Texas, narrated by Ty Macklin. Chapter 1. Traffic was busy, and it was a warm Friday evening. Dre Owen sat in the passenger seat of his mom's SUV as they made their way to their new temporary home. Dre's life had changed so much in just a span of a week. On Monday, he graduated from high school and was preparing to go to college in California at the start of fall. By Wednesday, he and his mom, Nicole, had gone through a house fire that destroyed his childhood home. It was now Friday, and Dre and his mom were packed up and ready to move with his Aunt Lauren and her son, Marcus, in Indianapolis. Dre grew up in a small duplex in the Tower Grove South neighborhood on the south side of St. Louis. The neighbors were the reason for the house fire. Their kitchen had caught on fire after something burned in the oven, causing it to spread throughout the entire complex. The night it happened, Dre got home around 11.30 p.m., and Nicole was standing outside sobbing loudly. The entire neighborhood stood outside, observing while the only place he knew as home burned in flames. The only possessions he had left were the clothes on his back and his cell phone. It was a slap in the face for him. All they had to do was stay with some family in another town for a couple of months until things got fixed. When Dre was seven years old, his dad, Rich Owens, owned a car repair shop in East St. Louis for two and a half years. Rich saved all he could to invest into his shop after marrying Nicole. His biggest struggle was he lacked business and leadership skills. The bills were never kept up on, the profit was barely breaking even, and the employees were always quitting. The business ended up failing due to lack of cash flow. This caused his dad to file for bankruptcy. Once the business crashed, there was tension between Dre's dad and his mom because he developed a bad drinking habit. Once he started to slack on keeping up with the bills and rent, Nicole kicked him out and ended up filing for divorce. The divorce was a tough time for Rich, Dre, and Nicole. Rich's drinking problem worsened around that time as well. The way he looked at it, he had lost his family and his business, so he really had nothing to live for. Nicole stressed because she felt like the divorce was affecting Dre, as it was. Dre had sleepless nights thinking about why his family fell apart. He could not understand as a kid why his parents could not just work things out. After the divorce, Dre's dad ended up moving to the north side of St. Louis and living with his brother. Dre and his father had a bland relationship after he got kicked out. They saw each other here and there, but never spent much time with each other. Dre's dream was to someday own a business and pick up where Rich left off. His plan was to major in business in college and start a million-dollar corporation someday. Nicole worked as a receptionist at a downtown hotel before the fire. She always found some way to make ends meet. Dre sat in silence contemplating about the house fire and his future as they drove through traffic on I-70. The fire was a big blow. He did not have much to his name material-wise anymore. I'll find a job in Indiana in no time. You just focus on going to school. This is all temporary for you, his mom said as she slowly progressed through traffic. Dre did not give a response. He was too wrapped up in his thoughts. She did not want to sit in silence, so she tried to keep the conversation going. You'll be able to hang with Marcus until you go off to college, too. You're not excited for that? Nicole added. Yeah, I guess it'll be straight. I haven't seen Marcus in some years now, Dre answered. Everything will be all right. I want you to just focus on school. You're going to make something of yourself. Dre nodded his head and said, I'll stay focused. I just can't believe this is all going down like this. Life is a bunch of tests, son. There's going to be tests from now until you die. You just have to get through them and stay true to yourself in the end. You know what you want in life, right? Yeah. Okay, well stay true to that no matter what kind of tests you're going through. When they finally arrived in Indianapolis, they pulled up to a one-story house located on the far east side of the city. The sun was setting. Aunt Lauren came outside, stood on the porch, and waved excitedly. Nicole and Dre got out of the car. Hey, y'all, she greeted excitedly. She was short and stocky. Her skin was dark, and her hair was covered up by a black scarf. Her smile was bright and wide. She was wearing a long purple nightgown 
and brown house shoes. Hey, girl, I haven't seen you in forever, Nicole said as she approached the porch with a big grin on her face. Nicole and Aunt Lauren quickly hugged each other and started catching up on things while Dre grabbed his bag to take in the house. As he approached the porch, Aunt Lauren exclaimed, Look how much you've grown. How have you been, nephew? He gave her a hug and responded by saying, I've been good, Aunt Lauren. How about you? I've just been taking it day by day, she said. Where should I put my bag? Dre questioned. You can put them in the basement. That's where Marcus stays. He should be down there right now. I don't know for sure, though. He may have left. Dre walked in the house and made his way downstairs to the basement. Loud music blared as he got closer to the entrance. The first thing he seen directly across from him when entering was a washer and dryer. He turned his head and noticed his cousin, Marcus, playing a basketball video game. The air was cold and the lights were dim. Marcus was sitting on his bed and his TV was big. Directly on his left was a couch. What's going on, cuz? Marcus greeted. Marcus stood up and turned down the music before reaching for a handshake. He was dark with a short haircut. He was about an inch taller than Dre and skinny. His black sweatshirt was baggy and he had gray sweatpants on. Dre shook his hand and said, What's up, man? How you been? I've been cool, man. I heard about what happened to your spot. That's crazy. I couldn't believe it. I can't believe it either. It is what it is, though. I'll be all right. No doubt. You want to play the game? Yeah, Dre said as he grabbed a controller and joined his cousin on the game. While they played the game, they chopped it up. Dre told him about how he planned on cruising through the summer until he got to college. Marcus talked about how he dropped out of high school after his basketball career came to an end. I was the best hoop on the squad and they kicked me off because they said I stole one of the teammates' wallet out of their locker. After that, I didn't care. I dropped out, Marcus said when he described it. Dre talked about how he lost everything materialistically in the house fire. He talked about not having any money to recover from the disaster. I grew up in that place, so for everything to just burn away like that is just bogus, Dre explained. I ain't even got money to recover from this bullshit, man. Later in the night, after Dre got settled in, it was about time for him to call it a night. Can I sleep on the couch? Dre asked. Yeah, that ain't no problem. I'll be in my bed, Marcus responded. You about to go to sleep? Yeah, man, it's about that time for me. All right, I'm about to head out. I'll be back. Marcus got dressed in different clothes and left the house. When Marcus left, the TV played cartoons while Dre lied on his back staring at the ceiling. He was happy that he felt comfortable. Marcus seemed like a cool guy. Dre had not seen him since he was 12 years old, so he was happy to catch up on things with him. He dozed off and ended up waking up in the middle of the night to someone arguing. What did I tell you about coming in my house at 2 in the morning every damn night? Aunt Lauren hollered. Aunt Lauren was yelling at Marcus. They were upstairs by the front door, and it was about 2 in the morning. Mom, I'm grown, he could hear Marcus respond. Grown my ass! When was the last time you paid a bill, she exclaimed. Ever since you dropped out, you've been doing nothing but bringing females in and out my house and sitting around being lazy. Drake could hear another female upstairs say, I'll just leave. You ain't got to leave. She always be tripping like this, Marcus said to the unknown female. No, she needs to leave and you need to go to bed right now, Marcus, Aunt Lauren demanded. He could hear the house door open and close as if someone left. The next thing he heard was footsteps coming down the stairs to the basement. It was Marcus. He turned on the light as soon as he entered. You still up? He asked as he sat down on his bed. Yeah, Dre said. Man, I was about to have a sexy brawl come through, but my mom made her leave, Marcus responded as he dug in his pockets. Look what I made while I was out, though. He pulled out a roll of money and started thumbing through it, showing it off to Dre. Damn, where'd you get that from? Dre exclaimed. Shh. You're too loud, man, Marcus warned. I go to this bar a few blocks from here called Tea's Sports and Drinks. I get on the pool table and bet big all the time. Sometimes I lose, but when I win, I win big. But you ain't even 21 yet, Marcus chuckled as Dre sat with a puzzled look. I know a dude that works at the front door. He used to sell me weed in high school after the basketball games. Dre eyeballed the cash Marcus was playing with in his hands. I'm trying to make some bread like that, Dre said as Marcus laid it down on his bed. You any good at pool or shooting dice? Marcus questioned. 
I'm good at pool. I really never shot dice before, Dre answered. That's how you got that money? Yeah, I go in there and take the old folks' money on a regular basis. We can go tomorrow. I'll see if you're good or not. Marcus thumbed through the money one more time before stashing it under his pillow, turning off the lights and laying down. Dre lied on the couch across from Marcus's bed, thinking about what had just happened. He knew he was good at pool, but he questioned the situation just a bit. He wondered if people were really betting as much as Marcus had. Things did not seem to add up at first. There was nothing to show for it. No cars, clothes, or even food in the house. Marcus was asleep, so Dre just planned to ask questions the next day. Chapter 2 Wake up, Dre, Nicole said as she stood over Dre's shoulder trying to wake him up. Dre did not get much sleep, but that's how it had been for him lately anyway. He woke up and noticed Marcus was not in his bed. His mom was standing over him with a pink t-shirt and jeans on. Her hair was in a ponytail, and she was smoking a cigarette. Your dad is outside. He wants to talk to you, she added. Dre had not seen his dad since about a week before the house fire. They had run into each other at a gas station on a late night and chopped it up about Dre's upcoming graduation and his future. It did not end well. He told his dad, I just want to start a business someday. I want to pick up where you left off. You feel me? Rich immediately turned defensive when Dre made that statement. The fact that he did not own his business anymore felt like a knife to his heart every time he thought about it. When he had first opened the car repair shop, everyone was behind him. But once it failed, he had no one to lean on. I fucking failed because the white people took what I own from me. Don't ever forget that, punk. I didn't need college like you, his dad said to him that night. After his dad responded like that, Dre stayed calm and got back inside the car with the girl he was riding with. They had just got back from a party, and he did not want to let his dad ruin his night. He knew Rich had a lot going on. The girl Dre was with pulled off, and he had not talked to his dad since. A week later is when his house burned down. Dre stood up and put on a white t-shirt before going upstairs to talk to Rich. When he got upstairs to the front door, he noticed Rich standing on the porch wearing a black polo shirt and a pair of khaki shorts. He could tell his dad dressed a little nicer than usual because he was coming around the cold. He knew that his dad did not like his mom to know that he was still drinking heavily. Son, can I talk to you out here really quick? Away from your mom, Rich asked as he gestured Dre outside. Dre quickly looked back at his mom one time and then walked outside. His dad shut the door behind him. Son, I'm sorry for what I said to you before your house caught on fire, his dad started by saying. I've just been stressed ever since I lost the business, and getting back on my feet seems like the hardest thing ever. Pops, how did you even get here? Dre questioned. Rich chuckled and said, Boy, the bus don't cost nothing but $100 to get out here. So you came all the way out here just to apologize to me? His dad paused. He took a quick glance at the taxi he had waiting for him at the curb and then looked back at Dre. I wanted to make sure my son was okay. I just heard your house burn down, the house I watched you grow up in. I know what I said to you was wrong. College is a good decision. I'm just kind of jealous it's a move I didn't make, Rich admitted. That was the first time Rich ever had admitted that. Dre noticed Marcus walking up to the porch. He had a do-rag on his head and was talking on his cell phone. He gave Dre dap as he quickly speed walked into the house. He seemed as if he was on the phone with someone important, so Dre just continued conversing with his dad. I appreciate you coming through, Pops. I accept your apology about what you said, too. I want you to know that one of these days I'm starting a business to help all of us, Dre said. I'm going to make you proud. His dad reached out for a handshake. Dre gave his dad a firm look in the eye before shaking his hand and then shook his hand. No, I'm going to make you proud, son, Rich said. I'm leaving tonight. My bus leaves at 10. I just needed to check on you. He gave him a hug before leaving the porch and heading towards the taxi. Where are you going right now? You said your bus leaves at 10. That's a while from now, Dre asked as his dad sat down in the back of the taxi. I'm kicking it. I didn't come down here to not enjoy myself. The bus station is downtown anyway, so that's where I'll be, his dad said before shutting the door. Dre watched the taxi pull off. His dad was in the back seat throwing up the peace sign at him as the taxi pulled away from the curb. 
When Dre walked back in the house, he noticed his mom reading the newspaper on the couch in the living room. What did your dad have to say? She asked. Nothing special. He just was checking up on me, Dre responded. She still wasn't even aware about what happened the night Rich got mad. Dre didn't like seeing his parents clash, so he never told her. Mm Mm-hmm. It's about damn time he decided to check on his son for once, Nicole replied. I have a job interview next week. I told you it wouldn't take long for me to make something happen. Where? At a college downtown. I'll be a receptionist for their admissions office. If I get this job, then I should be out of Lauren's house before the summer is even over. Aunt Lauren entered the living room from her bedroom. She was wearing a navy blue button-up shirt and navy blue pants. Speaking of the devil, Dre said. Y'all were talking about me? Aunt Lauren questioned. I was just telling Dre I had an interview for a receptionist job downtown, Nicole answered. Oh, really? Girl, that's good news. You're moving so fast. Y'all just moved in yesterday, Lauren responded. Yeah, I applied last week. I knew right when the house burned down that I was going to have to find another job. Once I found out I was moving here for a little while, I applied. I just needed to wait for them to tell me when my interview was, Nicole said. Aunt Lauren grinned and said, You're smart just like Mama. I'm heading off to work. I get off at six, so I'll talk to you around that time. Aunt Lauren cleaned a warehouse for a chip factory on the outskirts of Indianapolis for a living. When she walked out the house, Nicole instantly looked at Dre. Did you hear her and Marcus arguing last night? Nicole whispered. Yeah, Dre responded. I raised you right. Don't get out here and do anything that'll get you in trouble. You stayed out of trouble in St. Louis, so you should be able to out here too, she said. I'm about to go out and look for more jobs. I'll talk to you when I'm done. I thought you already had an interview. Keyword, son, interview. That doesn't make the job guaranteed, she answered. Dre took what his mom said into consideration. He admired how hard she was working to find a job. When he headed back down to the basement, the first thing he saw was Marcus sitting on top of the washing machine. That was your pops? I ain't seen him in forever, said Marcus. Yeah, that was him. Y'all look just like each other, man. Y'all both ugly, Marcus joked. Dre could not help but laugh and just say, fuck you, man. You ready for tonight? Marcus asked. You know I'm ready. I need that money. Good, because I'm going to need you if you're good for real. So how does it work? Drake questioned. Damn, does it really seem that hard? We go in there, play pool, and get paid. You sound a little nervous, said Marcus. I'm glad I'm just seeing what you got tonight. I'm nervous over here because of you, and I usually never get nervous. How far is it from here? We have to walk? Marcus chuckled and said, Now you know I got a shorty who can let me use her car. You've been my cousin forever. You know how I get down. Dre had never worked because his mom always made sure he was focused on school. She was one of the biggest factors of his decision to go to college. That was his reason for not having a car. Marcus, on the other hand, had dropped out of high school. He had a job at a car wash once for about a month before getting fired. He never got another job after that. Dre and Marcus were in the same position as far as transportation. Piers, taxis, and walking were their main ways to get around. Dre laughed after Marcus' statement because it was funny to him that Marcus had so much pride in not having a car. I'm all for it then, cuz, Dre responded. Marcus smiled and reached out for a handshake. When Dre reached to shake his hand back, Marcus's phone rang. He stared at it silently for about a second before he answered it. Hello? Marcus answered. Dre walked away and sat on the couch while Marcus was on the phone. All he could hear was Marcus's replies. Yeah, I already know. Everything you're saying right now is exactly what he told me. Okay, okay. I'll be there next week. After that, he hung up. Dre knew that Marcus had his own life, so he didn't even bother to ask him who he was on the phone with. He was still thinking about the money Marcus was touching the night before. He imagined himself with it. He was never taught how to go to work. The only thing he knew was focusing on books and his career. He needed money at this very moment, though. He thought about all the things he needed, a car, clothes, and tuition money. I have to go somewhere, Marcus said to Dre. I'll be back when it's time to slide to the bar. When Marcus left, Dre was just playing the game. He played the game for about a few hours. Right when he was about to take a nap, his phone rang. 
It was Marcus, so Dre answered it fast. I'm outside, Marcus said. Dre didn't even respond. He just hung up the phone and slipped on his shoes. Marcus was outside in a gray 2004 Ford car, blasting his music. Dre walked up to the driver window and knocked on it. Marcus rolled down the window. What the hell you want, man? You messing up my vibe, Marcus said. You need to get in. Where the hell did you get this car, Marcus? Dre responded. Marcus shook his head and said, Man, didn't I tell you I know people who got my back when it comes to stuff like this? Get in the car. I ain't got all night. Dre got in the car. The first thing he noticed was a car seat in the back seat. There was paper all over the floor in the front seat. The car was filthy. You mess with some dirty females, man, Dre joked. Marcus laughed and responded, Hey, man, if they do shit like let me borrow their car, it is what it is. They both laughed as they rode through traffic. Marcus pulled a joint out. You smoke weed? Marcus questioned as he lit it. Nah, not really, Dre said. Marcus chuckled and said, more for me, and took a puff. When they pulled up, Marcus turned down the music and put the joint out. The building was small and there were not many cars parked in the lot. When they got out of the car, Dre noticed it was a warm night. There were two big bouncers at the entrance. He let Marcus lead the way. One of the guards was tall, dark, and heavyset. His size resembled a football lineman's size. He had a tall afro and a big beard. The other was tall, muscular, and white. He had brown hair and a shaved face. Marcus approached the black one. Burger, what's up, my boy? Marcus said as he reached out for a handshake. The guard shook his hand. What's up, Marcus? You already know the same rules as always. Stay out of trouble in there and no drinks, the guard said. Dre, this is Burger, my bro I was telling you about, Marcus said. We call him Burger because... This your homeboy or something? Burger interrupted and asked. Dre recalled Marcus saying something about knowing somebody at the door. Now he knew that person was Burger, the bouncer at the front door. Nah, that's my cousin, man, Marcus said as he made his way into the bar, gesturing Dre to follow. The bar was filled with cigarette smoke. Rap music blared as they entered, and it was packed with people. There were four pool tables to the right of Dre as soon as he walked in. On his left was the bar. Two men and a woman were sitting at the bar. One of the pool tables was taken up by a black guy with dreads. Marcus grabbed a pool stick and handed it to Dre before setting an empty table up. Marcus started to rack the pool balls up and grinned before saying, I finally get to see what you got. When he finished, Dre broke the triangle of pool balls. He got off to a good start instantly as two stripes went in. He aimed for another good corner, hit, but missed it. Now it was Marcus' turn. Marcus responded by knocking in three balls, back to back, before finally missing one. That set Dre up perfectly. Dre knocked in three more of his balls. He made it look as easy as writing his name. There was only one more striped ball left compared to Marcus's three solids. You ain't too bad, Marcus stated before taking another shot. When Marcus took his shot, he missed. Dre got back on the table and ended up knocking in the rest of his balls to win the game. When he finished hitting in the final ball, he looked up and noticed Marcus smiling. You're better at this than I thought, Marcus said. I told you I know what I'm doing, Dre responded. As Marcus started to rack the pool balls back up, Dre's phone rang. It was his dad. Before he answered, he assumed his dad would need a place to stay because he missed his bus or something of that nature. Hello, he answered. Son, Rich said. What's going on, Pops? Dre responded. What you doing right now? Dre thought of a quick fib to tell and said, playing the game with Marcus. Look behind you, Rich said. Dre turned around to notice his dad sitting at the bar, angrily staring directly at him. Rich was wearing a navy blue basketball jersey and the same khaki shorts he was wearing earlier. Dre's heart dropped as he hung his phone up. He seen his dad start gradually making his way towards him. So this is what you do now? Rich angrily questioned when he got to his son. How the hell did you even get in here? You ain't 21? Dre paused momentarily before saying, Pops, we're just trying to have a good time. Oh, hell no. Your mom ain't getting away with this. I found my 18-year-old son in the bar playing pool? As soon as Rich said that, Dre's eyes got big. The last thing he needed was his dad telling his mom about this. 
His mom made it clear to him that she wanted him to stay out of trouble while he was in Indianapolis. Nicole was stressed enough with everything that was going on. Dre did not want to stress her more. Pops, no, please don't tell on me, Dre said. Nope, I'm sorry, son. She makes me seem like I'm such a bad guy and she can't even pay attention to you. You're out in this bar in a city that you don't even live in. I don't think you realize how serious this is, his dad responded. There were times when Nicole would tell Rich he was not a good dad. That would hurt him. He looked at this as an opportunity to finally catch her in the wrong with actual proof. Dre getting in trouble was the last thing on his mind. Pops, I'm grown. She ain't got to keep her eyes on me every single hour of the day. That's your problem now. You think you're grown. You ain't grown, boy. We're only here playing pool. This shouldn't be that serious, Pops. His dad started to dig in his pocket for his cell phone as he said, I'm calling your mama. So you're going to tell on me? She needs to know that she needs to keep a better eye on you. You're out here in an Indianapolis bar with your cousin. Do you hear how bad that sounds? You don't know shit about the city. So why are you just out here kicking it at bars like this is home or something? Rich exclaimed. She ain't doing her job. Sadly, it did sound bad and Dre was wrong for this situation. Although he was not in the bar drinking or gambling, it still made him and his mom look bad. I didn't even tell her when you got mad and disrespected me all because I said I want to pick up where you left off with business. You know, if I would have told her that, she would have been mad. Rich stopped dialing the number on his phone and glared at Dre. He pointed at Dre and said, that's where you went too far. There it was again, the knife in his heart. Dre bought up the failed business again, and this time it was in public. Rich continued dialing the number. At this point, he wanted Dre to get in trouble. He felt like Dre was not caring about his feelings. He thought Dre knew how hurt he was about his business failing. Rich was so ashamed about it that talking about it would even set him off every time just like tonight. That was one of the main reasons he and Nicole were divorced. Before they could even see Rich tell Nicole, Dre and Marcus left the bar and headed back to Aunt Lauren's house. Chapter 3 When they pulled up to Aunt Lauren's house, they knew someone was up because they could see the light on in the living room. Usually around this time, they would be asleep. What do you think your mom is going to say? Marcus asked as they approached the front door. Dre shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know, man. When they walked in, the first thing Dre noticed was Aunt Lauren and his mom sitting on the couch in the living room. Nicole was smoking a cigarette and wearing a bonnet on her head. She stared at Dre with an irate look and was wearing an orange, old, long t-shirt as a gown. Aunt Lauren was wearing pretty much the same thing as Nicole except she had an actual red gown on. Aunt Lauren instantly got up and hollered at Marcus. Oh, so you've been coming in this house late because you've been out at the bar gambling. You think you're grown, huh? Marcus shook his head and said, think? I don't think I'm grown, mom. I know I'm grown. Aunt Lauren chuckled and said, oh, really? Follow me really quick. Aunt Lauren walked downstairs to the basement and Marcus followed behind her. Nicole just angrily stared at Dre. She took a few puffs of her cigarette as she sat there silently. Dre could practically feel her anger in the room. He started to feel uncomfortable, so he tried to walk away. Sit your ass down, Nicole demanded before he could leave the living room. He stopped in his tracks and looked back at his mom. The vibe felt as negative as it could. After looking in his mom's eyes and seeing how serious she looked, he sat down on the couch. She took a few more puffs of her cigarette before finally breaking the silence. What's your problem? Do you like stressing me out? She questioned. He was surprised by how calm she was speaking. Her tone was a lot calmer than she appeared to be. Dre did not give an answer. Dre, answer me, she added. He shook his head and replied, I don't have a problem. You don't have to stress about me, Mom. I'll always be all right. That was easy for him to say. Everyone knows that a good parent is always worried about their child. Dre did not understand that Nicole was dealing with just as much as he was. Although she just got hired for a new job, she was still struggling with the trauma from the house fire. Unlike Dre, she was home when the fire happened. I hope you're not losing your focus out here, Nicole said. We can't afford that. Before Dre could say anything, there was a knock at the door. Who is it? Nicole called. It's me. It was Rich. As soon as Dre heard his voice, 
he became irritated. He thought to himself, why is he even still in town? Go open the door, Nicole ordered. When Dre opened the door, he noticed his father standing on the porch with a cup of liquor in his hand. He was still wearing the same clothes he had on at the bar. Dre looked back at his mother and noticed her standing with a look of disgust as she glared at Rich. You must be out your damn mind, Nicole said to Rich. Not at all. You're out of your mind, Rich said before taking a sip of his cup and stepping in the house. You got my son out here in bars and shit. Rich, you don't know what me and Dre have going on. You need to go back to Missouri. We don't need you, Nicole said. Obviously, you do if Dre's all out at bars and shit and you laid up in your sister house being unproductive. Did you forget that I'm the man who bought the duplex you ruined? Don't forget I put a roof over y'all head, he exclaimed. Rich was clearly drunk. The fact that he was talking to Nicole so disrespectful began to frustrate Dre. He knew she was already going through a lot. He already had been caught at a bar. His father yelling at her would do nothing but stress her out more. Pops, you need to chill out, man. Why you even here? You said your bus leaves at 10, Dre said. Boy, let me tell you something, Rich said as he pointed his finger in Dre's face. You're here because of me. I made you and I raised you. Remember that, player? Get your finger out my face, man, Dre demanded. Rich laughed as he took another sip of his cup. This is why you should have disciplined him more as he was growing up, Nicole, Rich said. I'm his dad and he's talking to me like some nigga in the streets. This is what you've raised. His words were slurring, and he smelled like liquor. Rich was making Nicole feel terrible. Dre was not surprised by the way his dad was acting, because this is the type of thing that made his mom kick him out in the first place. When he got drunk, there was no filter. When people are hurt, they do a lot to try to heal that wound. Rich's way to heal his wounds was alcohol. There were side effects like sickness and high blood pressure, but what Rich appreciated is how it made him forget the bad things going on around him. Little did he know the worst side effects that alcohol had on his life was the destruction of his family. I think you should leave, Nicole calmly said to Rich. Marcus and Aunt Lauren came up the stairs from the basement. Marcus had a backpack on and was holding a shoebox. Rich finished the little bit of liquor that was in his cup and said, I'll leave. I don't care. You need to focus on being a better parent. Leave my house right now, Aunt Lauren ordered Rich. She already knew what Rich was on. She had been hating him. Anger filled the room. Everyone was frustrated at this point. Rich stood up and started to stumble towards the front door. All Nicole could think about was the negative insults that came from Rich's mouth. A drunk mind speaks to sober heart. That is how Rich really felt, and it hurt Nicole. She glared at him with hate as he unsteadily walked out of the door. Dre wondered what made his dad do what he did in front of company. He knew Aunt Lauren and Marcus could hear the commotion in the basement. Seeing him act the way he did not necessarily surprised him because he seen Rich act like this before. His dad acting like this in front of people is what surprised him. Aunt Lauren was pissed. She already was in the basement arguing with Marcus. Now she had to deal with Nicole's ex-husband. She ended up demanding Marcus to leave as well. You get out too, boy. I'm sick and tired of this, Lauren said. Since you're so grown, go be grown. Marcus's way of thinking was not as logical as it should have been. He felt like he would never get as far as he wanted because of where he started. Unlike Dre, Marcus did not have a father to guide him in the right direction. Lauren had bills to pay, and once Marcus was old enough, she no longer catered to him the way she used to. Marcus made his way out of the house as well. I'm just going to call it a night, Nicole said. Dre and Lauren could hear the hurt in Nicole's voice. What Rich said had gotten to her, and Dre did not like it. Don't worry about Rich's drunk ass, Aunt Lauren said to Nicole to make her feel better. You know you've done a good job with Dre. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Lauren, but I'll be fine, Nicole responded. She just wanted to go to sleep and move on from what was going on. Talking about her problems to Lauren would not fix them, and she knew that more than anyone. Dre ended up walking back downstairs to the basement. When he sat on the couch and pulled out his cell phone, he noticed he had four missed calls from Marcus. He then realized Marcus had been texting him as well. He called Marcus back. Hello? Marcus answered. You called? Yeah, man. As you can see, my mom kicked me out. We can still get this money, though. I have bets already lined up for next week, so relax yourself because next week is game time. 
Wait, Marcus, how do you have bets on the table already? I told you, I do this often. The plan is to play the four games we have scheduled and get paid. If everything goes right, we'll leave with about $4,000 apiece. That was a lot more than Dre was expecting. You're telling me that you bet on pool games so often that you make more than a couple hundred? Did it look like just a couple hundred when I came in the house after the bar last time? Of course not, because I wouldn't even waste my time with it if all I was going to make was a couple hundred. I could get a normal job for that. So where are you staying until then? Dre asked. I'm just staying at some of my homies' cribs or at some shorty's crib here and there until I figure something out. If my mom wants to act like an asshole, then so be it. Why was your pop so eager to snitch on us tonight, man? I don't know, to be honest. Sometimes I think he just can't get over the fact that his business failed. That was years ago, man. He needs to let that shit go, Marcus responded. It's probably not that. It is, Dre said. There was a pause before Marcus said, I'll hit you up when it's game time. Bet. When Dre hung up the phone and lied down, he could not even sleep. There was a lot on his mind. The main thing he thought about was how his dad had just pissed him off. His thoughts were racing. He wondered if these bets were what they seemed to be. Nothing else seemed to be going right, so he hoped that at least the bets were legit. The next day, Dre woke up to Marcus playing the game in his room. Your mom let you come back? Dre asked. Nah, Marcus responded. Obviously, at this point, Dre was a little confused. So what are you doing here? I know when my mom works. At the end of the day, this is still my home. I'm not just going to let her kick me out. Before Dre could respond, Marcus's phone started to ring. All Dre could hear were Marcus's response to whoever he was talking to. Hello? He answered. I'm busy right now, man. I don't have time to talk about this. Dre started to notice Marcus getting irritated during the call. There was a frown on his face, and he even had paused the video game. Okay, man, I'll come by right now. Damn, he said before hanging up the phone. Dre began to feel a little worried. Marcus was his cousin, and he didn't want him to be in any trouble. You all right, man? Dre questioned. Marcus was already standing up packing clothes in a duffel bag. He did not give Dre a response. You don't hear me talking to you? Marcus looked up and said, I'm straight, Dre. I just need to go handle something real quick. My mom wants me gone anyway. Don't forget I need you next week. Marcus ended up rushing out of the basement with his backpack hanging halfway off of his back. Dre figured that Marcus was in trouble, so he decided to follow behind him. Marcus had just seemed so comfortable and suddenly jumped up out of nowhere. That made Dre suspicious. He had to trail far behind Marcus, so he did not notice him. Marcus's trail ended up leading to the bar. He got inside the passenger side of a red SUV. While Marcus was in the car, Dre sat and observed through the laundromat window across the street. He noticed that there was a woman in the driver's seat. She had a long ponytail and her skin was dark. He could notice her facial features well because of how far he was. Hey, you look familiar, an old raspy voice said behind him. He turned to notice an old man standing behind him. He was short and was wearing a yellow skull cap. He did not look familiar to Dre at all. The man's black t-shirt looked wore out and loose. He looked comparable to someone who would be on a corner somewhere asking for spare change. I think you got the wrong guy, Dre said. No, I think I know you from somewhere. I just can't remember exactly where, the man said. I recently moved out here, so you probably have me confused with somebody else. Have you ever been to tea, sports, and drinks? The guy asked as he pointed towards the bar through the window. Yeah, what makes you ask? Dre questioned. The man reached out for a handshake and said, I seen you on that pool table the other night. You can make some serious money out here playing the way you played last night. You're a new face at the bar, so it was easy to point you out. He noticed the man bringing up money before anything. Dre felt like this was the time to finally get the information he was missing out on. There was something Marcus was not telling him, and it was time to get to the bottom of it. He was finally face to face with the person who attended the bar on a regular basis. How much are you talking when you say I can make some serious money? Dre asked. The man chuckled and said, a few thousand a night. Where are you from? Dre was astonished. He was discovering an entire underground world he knew nothing about. 
If he knew he could make a few thousand a month just from playing pool, he would have been able to accomplish so much more. I just moved to here from St. Louis. You probably know my cousin, Marcus. Marcus is your cousin? I know that kid. You be careful with him because he's always in some shit, the man responded. Now that I'm in town, I'll try to keep him out of trouble, Dre responded. Word on the street is Marcus is in trouble with the owner of the bar, the man said. What you mean by that, Dre questioned. Well, I heard he owes him some money from some drugs or something like that. He wondered if this was why Marcus was betting. When he looked up, he noticed the truck Marcus was in across the street had left. Tell me more, Dre said. He needed more information, but he needed it fast. He thought to himself, where could have Marcus left to? I don't know much about it. I just know his ass is in trouble as always, the man responded. The fact that the man said, as always, made Dre questionable. He wondered why Marcus had a bad reputation in his own city, not only in his household, but on the streets as well. What you mean by that? Is he always in trouble or something? Dre asked. Yes, he's a shysty guy. At least that's what I've been told, the guy said. Dre was ready to leave. He decided to wrap up the conversation by saying, what's your name? You never introduce yourself. The man reached out for a handshake and said, they call me Red. Dre shook his hand and said, nice to meet you. I'm Dre. Chapter 4 When Dre left the laundromat and got back to the house, he noticed Aunt Lauren sitting on the living room couch watching television. Hey, Dre, where are you coming from? Aunt Lauren nicely asked with a smile. Just walking around, observing the city, Dre responded. He knew he could not tell her he had been following Marcus around. Did you eat? I know your mom is at work right now, she asked. I could eat, Dre responded. As they walked to the kitchen together, Aunt Lauren started to talk about Marcus. She asked Dre if he talked to him and explained how much she missed him already. You're a good example for Marcus. That's why I'm glad you're here for a little while, Aunt Lauren explained as she pulled out a pan of leftover lasagna from the oven and sat it on the counter. I just wish he would understand how hard I've worked for him. He doesn't need to throw his life away in these streets. I think he understands, Aunt Lauren. If he did, he wouldn't stress me out like this, she responded. The wild and shysty way that he's living ain't putting him in a good position. This was Dre's second time hearing someone describe Marcus and his acts as shysty. It made him wonder. What make you say he's living shysty? Dre asked. He comes home with money from God knows where all the time, she stated. People know I'm his mom. People walk up to me all the time and tell me all type of things about him. They heard the front door open. Aunt Lauren paused what she was saying. They both walked out of the kitchen to see who had come in. It was Marcus entering the house. His eyes got wide and he stopped in his tracks as soon as he seen his mom. You thought I wasn't going to be home, didn't you? She said. Mom, I thought you had to work, Marcus responded. You think I don't know you've been coming to my home when I've been at work whenever I kick you out? People tell me these types of things, Aunt Lauren exclaimed. Somebody lied to you, Mom, Marcus said. I just came here to pick up something that I left. Dre had not even noticed that Aunt Lauren had been home early. He did not pay close enough attention to the hours she worked. What did you come to pick up? She asked furiously. A sweatshirt I left downstairs, Marcus said. You got me out homeless in these streets. The least you could do is let me grab my sweatshirt. Aunt Lauren stared at Marcus with hurt for a moment. A tear slid down her right cheek. Don't act like you don't have a place to go, Marcus, Aunt Lauren said. I don't. What about all those fast girls you sneak in and out of here when you're living here? Mom, I'm your son. Why would you expect for me to stay with some broad off the street? Marcus, you're a grown ass man. You run in and out of here with money that comes from I don't know where all the time. What's been going on with that money? Why are you worried about my pockets, Mom? I... Before Marcus could finish, Aunt Lauren interrupted and said, I don't care about your money, Marcus. I want you to be safe, and you know that. Don't seem like it to me, Marcus said. You don't think I get tired of having people come up to me telling me all of the bullshit you've been doing out here? Like what, Mom? I told you already. Anything you hear out here is a lie. 
That's your problem. You'll believe some random people from the neighborhood instead of your own son. Well, since you don't ever believe me, believe this, Marcus said as he walked past his mom and headed to the basement. Dre followed behind him. When he got down to the basement, he seen Marcus sitting on his bed thumbing through a roll of cash. He counted a certain amount to give to his mom and put the rest in his pocket. When he looked up at Dre, he said, I got a little daughter on the way, man, so we double hustling out here. You for real? Dre asked. Yeah, that's my problem, though. We got a lot of money on the table for these bets. I'll be at my girl Jada's crib. She lives two blocks over in these apartments across the street from the gas station we always go to. I'll hit you up later. Before Dre could say anything, Marcus rushed upstairs. There was too much going on for him. Marcus had a kid on the way. Aunt Lauren and Marcus argued so much that Dre did not even get a chance to ask him more questions he had. One thing he wanted to know is why everyone calls him shysty. Even his own mom said it about him. He texted Marcus and said, Meet me at the bar tonight at 10. Marcus texted back, I'm not trying to go to the bar. Just meet me at my girl house. I'll be here. Bet, is what Dre texted back. Dre walked back upstairs and Aunt Lauren was sitting on the couch smoking a cigarette. Her legs were crossed and she looked angry. You okay, Aunt Lauren? Dre asked. She shook her head for a moment before she began shedding tears once again. Dre noticed the money Marcus had left sitting on the floor by the front door. That boy got some broad pregnant when he left me with a thousand dollars talking about he'll be back in a few years when he can make me happy, she explained while sobbing. Dre approached her and gave her a hug. I heard what Marcus said to you downstairs, Aunt Lauren added. Whatever he's talking about with these bets, please just don't do it. You need to stay here so you're not with him getting in any trouble. You're a good kid. Keep it that way. That night, he disobeyed Aunt Lauren and took a stroll to the apartments. It was warm. Dre was wearing a white t-shirt and a pair of red basketball shorts. Before he got to the apartments, he stopped at a gas station across the street. As he approached the entrance of the gas station, he noticed a group of men standing outside. There was three of them. One of them he had seen before. It was the guy, Red, from earlier at the laundromat. He was wearing the same yellow skull cap and wore out black tea from earlier. He was smoking a cigarette. When Red looked up to notice Dre, he gave a big grin as if he had known him for years. The other two guys looked like the type of people you would not see with Red. One was tall, slim, dark guy with dreads, while the other was light, short, chubby, and wearing a do-rag. They both had on nice jewelry and clothes. There were only two cars parked at the station at the time, so Dre assumed they were theirs. One was a nice white truck with tinted windows and white rims. The other was a silver luxury sedan with a sunroof and a nice sound system blaring. What's up, Mr. Secret Weapon? Red greeted as he reached out for a handshake. Dre shook his hand and greeted him back. He was confused as to why Red had just called him that. Red looked at the other two guys and said, This is the secret weapon we've been hearing about. The short chubby guy said, Yeah, that looks like him. What y'all mean by that? Dre questioned. Word on the street. You're the secret weapon for the battles on the pool table at the bar next week. I'm trying to find some money to put on you myself because you and Marcus shouldn't be getting rich without me. How am I the secret weapon? Because a lot of people don't know about you yet. You just moved here, and a lot of people who usually play and bet weren't at the bar the night you were, Red explained as he puffed his cigarette. Dre chuckled and made his way into the store. When he got in, he bought a sports drink and a bag of barbecue chips. This was new to him. In St. Louis, he had never seen people take gambling as serious as they were taking it in Indianapolis. When he got back outside, the cars and the two men were gone, but Red was still out there. Who were those guys you were kicking it with? Dre asked. Those are just people from the neighborhood, man. Since you're out here now, you'll see a lot of people on a regular basis. They'll be at the bar, Red responded. Are they betting on pool games too? Red chuckled and said, the whole hood is. When Dre got to the apartment, he did not even have to knock at the door because Marcus was already sitting outside on the stairs. He was smoking a joint and looking at his phone. What's up, cuz? Dre greeted. Marcus said nothing and just reached out for a handshake. Dre shook his hand and sat next to him. Dre could look in his face and notice he was going through some things. You good, man? Dre added. Marcus puffed his joint and said, 
I'll be all right, man. What did you need to holler at me about? I've been hearing a lot about you over the past 24 hours, Dre said. Being around my mom would do that to you, Marcus responded. I mean, I've heard things from more than your mom today, man. You know somebody named Red? Dre questioned. Marcus laughed hard and responded by saying, Yeah, that's the neighborhood junkie. Don't tell me you've been kicking it with him. Dre was happy to see a smile on Marcus's face. He had looked so gloomy when Dre had first approached. I ran into him, Dre said. What'd he say to you? Dre got straight to the point and said, He told me that you've got a reputation of being shysty. Why is that? You ain't been here long at all, and you already starting to remind me of my mama. Red is literally on drugs, man. You can't listen to the shit he says. The way Marcus made it seem made Dre almost feel as if he looked dumb in this situation. The way Marcus put it, Dre knew him because he never changed from when they were little. He decided to change the subject and start getting to the questions about the bets. So what's up with these bets? How do they work? Dre asked. It's basically $8,000 being betted all together. We're betting $4,000 apiece. We're playing four teams betting us $2,000 apiece. But I don't have $4,000. Marcus hit his joint and sat silently for a moment before saying, Me neither. At this point, Dre was confused. If neither of them had the money, then why would they bet? What the hell, Marcus? You need to do some explaining, Dre exclaimed. Just win and we get our money. I obviously put money on you because I believe in you. Let's just get this bread. You can't be acting scared, man. Dre glared at Marcus. Marcus was puffing the joint, getting to the end of it. Dre could not believe his cousin had got him in a situation like this. He would have never done anything like this to Marcus, and that is what made him the most upset about it. At this point, he had no choice but to win. There was too much on the line. How much you got in cash right now? Dre asked. Marcus took his last puff and chuckled before throwing the butt of the joint. Stay out of my pockets, man. This is what I mean when I say you're acting like my mom already. That comment made Dre angry enough to cause him to stand up. I'm about to bounce. I'll be at the bar ready to go next week, Dre said as he walked away from Marcus and went back to Aunt Lauren's. Chapter 5 Rich, Nicole, and Aunt Lauren were all at the house when Dre came back from talking with Marcus. They were all sitting in the living room as if they had been waiting for him to get back. Where are you coming from? Aunt Lauren asked. I was just taking a walk, Dre responded. A walk at almost midnight? Nicole asked. Dre stood and stared at them silently. I told you not to go with Marcus. I even asked nicely. Why wouldn't you listen to me? Aunt Lauren said. Dre wondered how they even knew he went to talk to Marcus. Another thing he wondered was why his dad was there. I wasn't with Marcus, Dre claimed. You expect me to believe that, Dre? Nicole asked. Son, I heard about Marcus saying something to you about betting, Rich said. I just want you to know that gambling could get addictive. It's a grown man's game and nothing to be played with. Dre started to get mad. He could not believe Aunt Lauren would even let his dad back in her house after the way he talked to Nicole. He glared at his dad. I'm planning on going to rehab next week. My drinking has gotten out of hand, Rich admitted. I can't believe y'all would even let him back in here, Dre said to Aunt Lauren and Nicole. You didn't just hear him say he's going to rehab, Nicole questioned. I don't care about rehab. Did you hear how he talked to you last time he was here, Dre exclaimed. I did hear how he talked to me, Dre, but one thing I won't have is you letting this situation we're in change you, Nicole said. Your dad is probably the only person that can get to your head. That's what you thought, Dre responded. Yes. Well, you thought wrong. You think this man cares about me, Dre explained. All he cares about is himself. If he cared about me, he wouldn't have talked to you the way he did. He wouldn't have let this family fall apart. Rich looked Dre in the eyes and said, you don't think I care about you? You're my son. I love you. I try. Dre was fed up, so he interrupted his dad. You're a counterfeit dad. I'm sick and tired of the apologies. Ain't you supposed to be back in St. Louis anyway? When you going home? Rich took a deep breath before saying, I can't force you to believe me. I came here to see my son before I head back home to get into rehab. You'll learn to respect me one of these days. 
He stared at Dre for a few moments before calmly exiting the front door of Aunt Lauren's house. So you're going to let your cousin influence you to do whatever this betting thing is? You're just going to let your dad leave? Even after he told you he was going to rehab? Nicole questioned. Dre disregarded the questions about his dad and played clueless about the gambling. I don't know what you're talking about. Aunt Lauren sighed and sarcastically said, Of course you don't. I took a walk. That's it, and that's all. If you're lying and you were with Marcus, you don't have to tell us. That's your cousin. Y'all supposed to hang out, Nicole said. Just don't let him influence you to do anything you wouldn't usually do. Dre stared at his mom silently. He was filled with anger. First, his cousin bets a bunch of money that they do not have. Then, Aunt Lauren and Nicole allowed Rich back even after he disrespected them so bad. Can I just go to sleep? I've had a long day, Dre asked. Sure, and while you're lying on the couch tonight, find it in your heart to forgive your dad, Nicole stated as he walked past her and headed to the basement. At this point, Dre had to take a lot in. It felt like life was moving at a million miles a minute for him. Getting through the summer was not as easy as he thought it would be. One thing he knew about himself was he was going to have to handle this gambling situation before he dealt with anything else. Too much money was on the line to lose. Instead of laying down and thinking about forgiving his dad like his mom asked, he contemplated on how he would tell Marcus to call the bet off. Chapter 6 It was a warm evening. Dre was standing outside of the gas station he seen red at. He was waiting for Marcus to pull up. He planned to meet Marcus to tell him to call off the bets. The goal was to go with him too and watch him call the bets off. He noticed Marcus pulling up in the same red truck he met the girl in when Dre trailed him to the bar. The music was blaring and he was cruising in slowly. When he pulled in, Dre opened the door and a cloud of weed smoke smacked him in the face. When Dre looked up, he instantly noticed Marcus was puffing on a joint. The truck had looked a lot cleaner than the Ford he drove on Dre's first night at the bar. Marcus turned the music down and started to pull to the side of one of the gas pumps. We need to call these bets off, man, Dre stated. I knew that's what you were going to say, Marcus responded. Why would you bet all this money knowing we didn't have it? I'm tired of being broke. It's as simple as that. This is the only way I know how to get money. Plus, we can make this bigger than what it is and make so much more. Marcus explained before pausing to take a puff of his joint. I'm trying to help you by putting you on. You need to take advantage. I don't need no help, man. I play pool for fun. Betting ain't a problem, but we need to start small first. I've been in this for a while, though. Like I said, man, I'm trying to help you get some money in your pocket. I don't need help. If you don't call off the bets, you're on your own, cuz. I can't believe you're even acting like this right now. You can't believe I'm acting like what? I'm just trying to get some money, Dre. Ain't you sick of being broke, man? We ain't got no cars, no homes, nothing. I'm sick of not having shit, dog. I feel you, but I'm standing on what I said. Marcus took another hit of his joint and put it out before saying, All right, well, on that note, I'm going to put some gas in this truck, then take you to the crib. I got business to handle. I know you're about to be in college in a few months anyway. Hopefully they put you in a good position. I'll meet you at the top. Marcus got out of the truck and pumped the gas. When he pulled up to Aunt Lawrence to drop Dre off, he said, Wish we could have got this paper together. I still love you, though, cuz. They shook hands and Dre walked back in the house. Nicole was on the couch watching a sitcom on television. You were just with Marcus, wasn't you? She asked. Yeah, I told him I won't help in the betting thing he had going on, he explained. She smiled and stretched her arms out for a hug. When he hugged her, she kissed him on the cheek and said, I knew I raised my boy well. Don't ever forget who you are. About two days later, while Dre was in the living room watching a crime show, he heard a knock at the door. The knock was hard and loud. He looked out the peephole and did not see anyone standing outside. When he opened the door, there was no one in front of the doorway. He looked around suspiciously and did not notice anything. Right before he was about to shut the door, he looked down to notice a folded piece of paper in front of him. He picked it up and read it. Dear Marcus, I'm tired of you ducking my calls. You think I've got time to do shit like send notes to you like this? Not answering my calls is fine, though. All I know is when it's time for you to have my money, you better have it. I'm not pushing back the due date for you again. I won't tell you what's going to happen if you don't have my money, 
Just know I sent this note to where you live, so I know where that's at, if you know what I mean. Another thing I want you to realize is if you try to hide when it's payday, I will find you. You know the streets talk. My office will be open on payday. Just come right on up. From a good old friend. Dre's jaws dropped and his eyes were wide. He read over the note three times before finally folding it up and putting it in his pocket. Whoever it was thought Marcus still lived in Aunt Lauren's house. He walked all the way to Deja's apartment where Marcus was staying. He knocked on the door for a while until Marcus had finally answered. He could tell by how Marcus looked that he had just woke up from a nap. What's up? Marcus said. Dre handed Marcus the note. He glared at Marcus as he read it. What's going on with this shit, man? Dre asked. Damn it, man, Marcus shouted as he kept rereading over the note. Who you owe money to, man? At this point, you're putting your own mama in danger, Dre said. Marcus took a deep breath and looked at Dre in the face. He looked back at the note and then back up at Dre. I owe a dude named Bo, Marcus admitted. Who the hell is Bo, Dre asked. He owns the bar. Before Marcus could finish, Dre hollered, So Red was telling the truth? What you owe him for, man? He loaned something to you? Yeah. What? We don't need to talk about it, man. It all made sense now. Red was telling the truth at the gas station and at the laundromat. Bo owned the bar. Marcus obviously did not want to tell Dre what he loaned him because it was probably drugs. The fact that Marcus lied to Dre made him look at him as shysty as everyone claimed. The worst part about it is the fact that Bo knew where Marcus's mom lived. How much you owe him? Dre asked. 8500 Dre's jaws dropped and his eyes opened wide again. That's all the money if you win those pool games. I hope you got some type of paper on you right now, he said to Marcus. I don't have much, but I can keep going with this gambling stuff to fix all of this shit. Is this Bo dude a dangerous guy or what? Should we be worried about him? We'll be good, man. Keep this situation between us. I'm going to take care of it. Don't even worry about it. Dre did not know whether to believe Marcus or not. He was starting to look at him as shysty, just like Aunt Lauren and Red said. He did not even want Marcus to drive him to Aunt Lauren's. He decided to walk back. Ironically, when he left the apartments, he noticed Red sitting outside of the gas station drinking a beer. He waved at Dre from across the street with a smile. Dre approached him and shook his hand. Mr. Secret Weapon, what's up? Red said. What's up, man? I got a question for you. And I've got an answer. What's up, kid? You ever heard of somebody named Bo? Yeah, I just recently heard that's who your cousin owes. I heard he's not playing. He's putting a hit out on him if he doesn't have his money by whenever he's supposed to pay him. Is he really dangerous, though? I've heard he can definitely get deadly. I stay away from him. Marcus will be all right. He'll get that money, Dre said. The reason Marcus did not want to tell Dre about Bo is because he really was a threat. He had loaned Marcus a lot of money and drugs over the past few months, and none of it had been paid back. The reason Bo never cared about loaning him this stuff is because he knew Marcus would never pay it back. Bo wanted him dead anyway. Marcus's dad, Teddy Calhoun, killed Bo's dad. That was something Marcus didn't know, but that was the reason Bo wanted him dead. What Dre did not know was that Bo was from the same place as him, St. Louis. His dad died when he was a freshman in high school. He moved to Indianapolis when he was released from prison after serving a 10-year sentence for attempted murder. He watched Marcus's dad shoot his dad in his head after an argument in his own house. And that caused him to go down the wrong road in life as well. Marcus's dad still had never been found by police. Marcus had only met him once his entire life, so he felt it didn't mean much to him. After that is when Aunt Lauren moved to Indianapolis. She thought moving there would help the situation. At this point, Dre was back in it. He had to play the games to win the money. Everyone who lived in Aunt Lauren's house, life was in danger. Red's word was more believable to Dre now. Sadly, that was one of the things that Marcus hated. He hated when his family believed people in the streets over him. With the lies he's told, though, he is hard to believe. That night before Dre fell asleep, he texted Marcus and asked him what day he had to pay Bo. He told Dre that he had to pay him on the same night as the pool games. 
Dre did not say anything to Marcus after that. His plan was to just show up to the bar and do his best to get his family out of this situation. Chapter 7 It was a rainy night. Thunder rumbled through the skies, but that did not stop people from going out to tea, sports, and drinks. When Dre arrived to the bar, he noticed the line was a lot longer than it was the first night he showed up. The parking lot was filled with vehicles. Before he could even make it to the back of the line, Berger said, Hey, come over here really quick. When he approached Berger, he said, What's up? Berger started to pat him down and say, You don't have to wait in line, man. You're playing tonight. When Dre got inside, the bar was filled with people. It was filled with smoke and it was loud. People were chatting and there was loud rap music playing in the background. There was also a few TVs mounted above the bar with sports analysts arguing back and forth. When he looked towards the pool table, the first thing he noticed was Marcus staring at him with a big grin on his face. Dre approached Marcus, shook his hand, and said, I'm so happy you walked through those doors. I knew it wasn't a chance of me winning this all by myself. Don't do this shit again, man, Dre demanded. Do what, Dre? Put some money that you ain't got on the game. What kind of sense does that make? I bet when we win and you got that extra $4,000 in your pocket, you're going to be thanking me. When it was game time, it was Dre against a tall white guy. He had on a black leather jacket with no sleeves and long hair. Dre broke the triangle and did not make any balls in. His opponent got off to a good start as he knocked in three stripes with ease before missing on his first go. When it was Dre's turn, he responded by knocking in two solids. It was a rough start for him. The guy ended up not making in any after that. Dre knocked in two more on his next go. Dre had four balls left on the table compared to his opponent's three. Dre knocked in one more before missing. The guy knocked in two more, leaving him with one left before missing and giving Dre another shot. Dre performed well under pressure. His opponent was in the lead with one ball left while Dre had two. He knocked them in smoothly. Dre then called out the left corner as his final shot for the eight ball and won the game. He made it look easy. That won Dre his first thousand dollars of the night. Boy, if this was a college sport, this is what you'd had have to go to school for, Marcus said as he handed Marcus his thousand dollars in cash. It was a stack of 50 $20 bills. It felt nice to him. It was like fuel to a fire. He was motivated to play and win more. His confidence shot up when he hollered, Who's next? I'm here all night. When he said that, Marcus got excited and began to pump him up as well. He needed the money more than Dre. His life was practically in Dre's hands. The next opponent was a lengthy dark man with braids and a goatee. He was wearing shades and a red hoodie. Dre let him break the triangle. The guy hit in two stripes just from breaking it. He did not slow down from there either. He hit a corner shot with another ball, then smoothly knocked in one more. After that, the guy missed. It was Dre's turn. He knocked in one. After that one, he missed the next. This was bad because Dre had six balls left on the table compared to his opponent's three. His opponent knocked in the last three with ease, just as Dre did last game. He missed the eight ball shot after, though. Dre was set up well, and his momentum grew after he knocked in two with one shot. After that, he knocked in four more back-to-back. -back. He called the eight-ball shot and won his second game of the night. Stop scaring me, making me think you're going to lose at first, man, Marcus joked as he handed Dre his second thousand dollars of the night. People were crowded around the pool tables. There was gambling going on at all the tables. Side bets were being placed. Dre heard a lot of people saying things like, He's not going to be able to win three in a row. It pumped him up. It made him motivated just like the money did. His next opponent was a chubby brown guy with a short afro. He was wearing a blue winter coat. Dre broke the triangle and knocked one solid ball in. He missed after that. His opponent came in on fire as he knocked two in with one shot on his first try. He then knocked in two back to back after before missing. Dre had six balls left on the table compared to his opponent's three. Dre slipped up and missed on his first try. The guy dominated the game after that and beat Dre. 
He knocked two in with one shot again and then smoothly hit in his last ball. He then pointed at Dre, called his hole for the eight ball, and won the game. Marcus and Dre both had to pay $1,000 out of what they had won. We need to go home while we got a little something, Dre suggested to Marcus after they paid their money to the guy they lost to. Since they had lost, they had to wait to get back on the pool tables. You can leave if you want. My mama's life is on the line tonight, Marcus said to Dre. Marcus, even if we win, you won't have enough. We might as well just disappear now, man. That ain't gonna work, man. He knows where my mom lives. You're right, man, Dre said. Let's try to get what we can. The last opponent was a young, dark, short guy. He had a beard and was wearing a cap twisted backwards. He had a white, long sleeve shirt on and a chain. Dre broke the triangle. He knocked in one striped ball from the break. From there, he hit two in with one shot. After that, he kept it up with the corner shot to knock in one more. Dre was on a roll. He hit two with one again. He then hit in his last ball and won the game after knocking in the eight ball. Dre won the last game. He and Marcus both had $3,000 in their pocket for the night. Good job tonight, man. You're cold with it, Marcus said as he gave Dre his last $1,000. So, what's the plan now? Dre asked. He's upstairs in his office, Marcus replied. I'm just going to walk in his office and try to pay him what I have. Dre followed Marcus as he started to maneuver through the crowd to get to the stairs. Dre's palms were sweaty and his heart was beating against his chest like a drum. He took a few deep breaths as they made their way up the steps. When they got up to the stairs, Bo's office was located down a long hallway. The lights were dim, and there were a few pictures of celebrities that had visited the bar before on the walls. They slowly approached the door. The door was an old wooden door. The doorknob was silver. There was a name tag on the door that read, Owner, Bo. When they got to the door, Marcus knocked on it. Dre's heart started beating faster than it was before. I know you're nervous. You can leave if you want, Marcus offered to Dre. You think I'll leave my cousin here in a situation like this? Marcus replied. No one had answered the door yet. Marcus gave it another try and knocked again. The music downstairs was blaring and the crowd chatter was muffled. Marcus was surprised that Bo had not opened the door yet. He looked at Dre and said, I'm about to just walk in. You ain't got to come in if you don't want to. I'm coming. Marcus interrupted Dre and said, just wait out here. You don't need to be involved with this. I'll be quick. I'm not letting you walk in there by yourself. We're leaving this place together tonight, Dre said. Marcus sighed and said, I guess, man, let's go. When Marcus opened the door, Dre could not believe what he'd seen. They slowly walked in the office. Bo was lying on the floor in the middle of his office, dead. As soon as Dre seen the body, his heart dropped. There was a bullet hole in the middle of his chest. What the fuck? Marcus said. Let's get the hell out of here, Dre recommended. It all happened so fast, neither one of them had time to discuss what was going on. Dre had never seen anything like this. He was standing directly over a dead body. Dre's thoughts were racing as fast as lightning. They turned around and ran out of the room. When they got halfway through the hallway, a group of police officers bolted up the stairs. They had guns and flashlights pointed at Dre and Marcus. Freeze! A few of the officers hollered. Get on the ground! demanded another. Dre and Marcus stopped in their tracks. They put their hands in the air and dropped to the ground. As they dropped to the ground, two officers rushed into Bo's office. Fuck, Marcus hollered. As officers started to cuff them, Dre asked, what's going on? The officer cuffing him replied, well, for one, neither one of you are 21. For two, there's a dead body right there and you guys are running. There's some investigation that needs to be done. We didn't do nothing, man, Marcus said. The officers paid him no mind as they picked him up off the ground and escorted him downstairs. They did the same with Dre a few seconds after. The bar was still filled with plenty of people, not as many as before the police were there, but it was still a decent crowd. It was still raining outside. One of the officers quickly put Dre in the back of a car. He was nervous. This was his first time ever being in the back of a police car. An officer sat in the front seat and said, what are you guys doing at a bar? Dre did not give him an answer. He did not know how to. He knew he was wrong for being in a bar. 
One thing he was not wrong for was the murder of Bo. He wondered what had happened. The night swiftly replayed through his head as he did not recall hearing gunshots any time during the night. Who would have thought Dre's summer would have went this way? He figured if he were truthful and calm, things would not turn out bad in the end. Police escorted Dre into a room by himself when they arrived at the police station. They sat him in a room with nothing but a table and three chairs. He sat in there for hours before two men walked in. One was a short, middle-aged white guy with short, gray hair. The other was a tall, middle-aged white man with a bald head and a mustache. They both sat down across from Dre. The short one sat down a folder and a tape recorder. I'm Detective Cox, and this is my partner, Detective Grant, the short one introduced. We work for the Homicide Investigations Unit of Indianapolis. Dre sat staring at the detectives with wide eyes. What's your name, kid? Detective Cox questioned. Dre stared for a moment before saying, Dre. Dre what? Cox responded. Owens, Dre said. What were you doing in a bar tonight? Cox asked. We, we, we just pl were playing pool. That's it, and that's all, Dre responded. Why were you in the owner's office if all you were doing was playing pool? Cox questioned. Dre did not want to put Marcus's business out there. He did not want to tell the police that he owed Bo money. If he did, that would put Marcus in a bad situation. I don't know. I was following my cousin. We were looking for the bathroom, Dre said. The fib was quickly thought of. He was under a huge amount of pressure. All he wanted to do was go home. He wished he had never even left Aunt Lauren's house that night. As the interrogation went on, the detectives made it seem as if Marcus had lied on Dre. Marcus is supposed to be your cousin, but he's told on you already, Detective Grant said late in the interrogation. You might as well come clean. Marcus would never, Dre said. Even if he did, it's a lie. So you didn't kill Bo? Grant asked. No. So who did? Cox asked next. How am I supposed to know? Dre responded. Because you were there, Grant hollered as he banged his fist on the table and got in Dre's face. Dre was nervous. He genuinely did not have answers for these guys. I didn't kill anyone. I promise all we were doing was playing pool, Dre explained. So Marcus is basically lying to us by saying you killed Bo, Detective Cox asked. Dre had a feeling that the detectives were lying. He felt like Marcus would have never made up a lie like that. He did not seem like the type to do that. Marcus was the reason they were even in the situation. So why would he lie on Dre? If he said that, then yes, it's a lie, Dre responded. After saying that, Dre refused to answer any more of the detective's questions. His fear grew more and more as the detective started to describe the maximum penalties he and Marcus could face. 45 to 65 years in prison sounded like a long time. It frightened him. He continued to keep his mouth closed as they described these things to him. All he wanted to do was leave. He figured if he kept his mouth shut, that would happen. Sadly, that is not what happened. The officers booked Dre into the Indianapolis jail that night. His plan for when he arrived was to call Nicole. If he would have listened to her and Aunt Lauren in the first place, he would have never been in this situation. Police at the jail informed him that he would have court the next day in the afternoon. They put him in a cell before allowing him to use the phone. Chapter 8 Dre sat in a cold cell staring at the wall. The paint was chipping, and there was a bunch of graffiti written and scratched into it. He thought of a million different lies he could tell his mom once he called her. If he would have listened to her and Aunt Lauren in the first place, he would have never been in this situation. The last time he had seen Marcus was when they were being walked out of the bar by the police. He heard an officer start to open the door of his cell and call out, Owens! They allowed him to go to the phone to make a call. He had been in jail for hours, and he knew his mom had been looking for him. When he dialed her number, he took a deep breath as it rang. He heard her answer. The phone stated, You have a collect call from an inmate at the Indianapolis jail. Do you accept the charges of this call? He could hear her say, Yes, I accept the charges. The call connected quickly, and Dre said, Mom! Dre, what the hell? How did you end up in jail? She angrily questioned. It's all a misunderstanding, I swear, Dre answered. Is there a bond set? What are the charges? 
me and Marcus were at the bar and someone got killed and Nicole interrupted him and exclaimed, killed? Someone got killed? This is why I told you not to go there in the first place. I know, Mom, I'm sorry. I just want to come home. I promise I didn't do anything or kill anyone, Dre replied. Dre did not hear a response after saying that. Nicole was still on the phone. She just was silently letting her tears slide down her face. Hello? Dre added. I have to find a lawyer. I'll be there tomorrow morning. I believe that you didn't do it. Just lay down and pray before you go to sleep tonight. You'll be fine. I love you and good night, Dre, Nicole said before hanging the phone up. Hearing the phone hang up made Dre's stomach drop. Hearing the hurt and pain in her voice made him feel even worse. He never wanted to disappoint her. When he got back to his cell, the first thing he did was pray. After about 10 minutes of praying, he lied down and stared at the ceiling. His mind raced for hours before he fell asleep. The next day, Nicole did as she promised and showed up with a lawyer. The lawyer's name was Ed Dallas. He made Dre comfortable when he spoke with him. After hearing Dre's story, he told him that he had nothing to worry about. We'll get you out of this in no time, kid. Just hang in there. If what you're telling me is true, then you should be fine, Ed told Dre. Hearing that made him feel a lot better. He knew that he was innocent. Proving it was going to be the hard part. Nicole mentioned that Aunt Lauren did not have enough for a lawyer, so Marcus would be using a public defender in his case. When he went to court for the first time, nothing special happened. The judge scheduled a trial date for two weeks later. Two weeks later. It was a chilly morning. This was Dre's second time ever being in a courtroom. He was eager to prove he was innocent. His lawyer seemed like he had taken care of everything with such ease. When the case started, Dre could not understand anything going on. The language of the law was not one he was fond of. Everything was moving in the right direction for him until one final witness made a statement. The prosecutor stated, Your Honor, I call Marcus Calhoun to the stand. Dre had not seen Marcus since the night they were caught at the bar. He turned his head to notice police escorting Marcus into the courtroom. He was in an orange jumpsuit with beat-up rubber sandals. As he walked in, he did not look Dre's direction the entire time. He calmly sat on the stand. They made him raise his right hand and swear on the Holy Bible that he would tell the truth. Dre was confused. Why was Marcus on the stand? Neither one of them were in the wrong. The prosecutor started the questioning by asking, Where were you the night Jalen Bo Jones was murdered? Marcus answered, Tea, sports, and drinks. Who were you with? The prosecutor asked. Dre Owens, Marcus responded. What happened while you guys were there? He accidentally shot Bo while we were in his office. Dre's eyes opened wide. He started to feel sick to his stomach. How? The prosecutor asked. We were going into his office to steal his gun, and he caught us before he could. That caused the accidental murder. Dre's jaw dropped. His own flesh and blood went on the stand and lied on him. He was not aware yet, but Marcus's reasoning for this was to get his time cut short if they were both proven guilty. Dallas could have easily gotten Dre out of this situation without Marcus lying. Marcus got sentenced to five and a half years and was shipped to a different prison from Dre. They ended up sentencing Dre to 10 years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. This frustrated Ed Dallas so much that he fought hard for the case to be reopened. He went and did something the investigators and prosecutors failed to do. They were so wrapped up on having Bo's weapon as the murder weapon, they missed one detail. He went to the bar and viewed the surveillance from that night. In the video, he noticed a man that walked in Bo's office about 20 minutes before Dre and Marcus did. The guy in the video was wearing a black sweater and a pair of weak colored boots. You can see him enter the office, but never come out in the video. He investigated even further and found out that the person that walked in that office was Marcus's dad, Teddy Calhoun. The way Ed found this out was he went to the streets. He asked around for days before finally running into an important, helpful witness. The witness was Red. Ed ended up finding Red at the same gas station he was always at. He talked to him about Dre's sentence, and that made Red tell it all. Dre's in prison for 10 years? He didn't even do it. I seen who did it, Red said. Who? Ed questioned. Do you know of somebody named Marcus? Calhoun? Yeah, it was his dad. 
At least that's what I thought he had finished doing when I noticed him jumping out of the window that same night. That was all Ed needed to get the case opened back up. All Dallas had to do was get Red on the stand to tell what really happened. Red respected Dre so much, he had no problem helping him get out of this situation. After Red took the stand, investigators found out that Teddy murdered Bo because he knew he was about to kill Marcus, even though he never took care of him. He still did not want to allow his son to die because of someone he killed earlier in life. They found Teddy at a bus station about to head to St. Louis. Marcus ended up facing even more time than he was before due to his lie. Some investigators figured he lied on Dre, particularly to cover his dad's trail. That was not the actual case because he did not know his dad like that. But since they took it that way, he was charged with obstruction of justice. This entire time, Dre was nothing but loyal to Marcus. Dre had called his dad counterfeit at one point. As of now, Marcus deserved that title more than anyone. Aunt Lauren apologized multiple times to Dre because of what happened. When Dre was released, he and Nicole pulled up to Aunt Lauren's house and noticed a taxi sitting outside. When Dre got out of the car, he noticed his dad exited the taxi. He smiled and approached Dre. I tried to tell you that gambling is a grown man's game, son, he said. Dre shook his head and said, I wish I would have listened. I've completed my time in rehab, having drank in almost a month, Rich said. Dre was proud. He reached out for a handshake. When Dre shook his hand, he said, I'm proud of you, Pops. You told me you would make me proud once, and you actually did. Thanks, son. You don't understand how good it feels to hear you say that, Rich said. Now make me proud. Finish school and get that business up and running. Dre was surprised by a lot of things. His dad was calm as if he did not care about the situation with him and Marcus. The other thing that surprised him was how much his dad had changed since rehab. He seemed a lot more positive than before. Dre had to be in California in three days for school. I'm surprised you ain't said nothing about me getting into a situation, Dre mentioned. Son, you're grown now. I can only lead you to water. I can't make you drink it. You got to bump your head a few times to learn your lesson. Did you learn your lesson? Of course. Good, because that's what I hope for. I'll be at the rest end, the hotel by the zoo downtown. When it's time for you to go to school, I want to say my last goodbye before you leave. Then I'm headed back to St. Louis. They shook hands. Then Rich hopped back in the taxi and rode off. Chapter 9 That night when everyone was asleep, Dre went outside to walk around the neighborhood. He wanted to enjoy the fresh air. It felt good to be free. The few weeks of jail time he had served seemed like years to him. He noticed Red standing outside of the gas station as usual. Dre had not seen him since the day he got on the stand. Red was wearing a pair of baggy gray sweatpants and a baggy t-shirt. He was puffing on a cigarette. Hey, kid! Red greeted. What are you doing out so late? Just getting some fresh air. I appreciate you getting me out of that situation, Dre responded. You don't have to thank me. When I hear you in jail, my respect grew for you. You want to know why? Why? Because I heard that you never told on Marcus, but he lied on you. Is that really why you got locked up? Dre shook his head and said, yeah, sadly. Well, now he's got to do time. Karma ain't no joke. You didn't notice what was going on between Marcus and Bo this entire time? You live with Marcus. How could you not notice? Dre did notice a few things. For example, Marcus's money was always inconsistent. He would have a bunch of money and could be dead broke the next. The reason for this was because Marcus had to keep paying everything he would make to Bo. Another thing he noticed is how Marcus would be calm one moment and would receive a phone call or text that would make him instantly get up and leave. All of this was a result of Bo and his crew trying to get their money from Marcus. Now that you mention it, there were a lot of things that I noticed that made it obvious, Dre said. I just didn't want to believe it at first. Red chuckled and said, I know how that goes. <laughs> if I gave you a fake $20 bill right now and didn't realize it was fake until you got home, it's too late. Explain what you mean by that. You didn't realize Marcus was counterfeit until the damage was already done, Red explained. Sometimes even when you realize a person is counterfeit, 
you ignore it because of the love you have for them. That's exactly what went down, Dre said. I'm not surprised. You're legit, Red. I respect you. I respect you too, kid. Stay out of trouble, Red responded. They shook hands. Red hopped on his bike and rode off as Dre entered the gas station. He purchased a bottle of soda and a pack of gum. When he got back to Aunt Lauren's that night, he reviewed the summer in his mind for hours before finally going to sleep. Two days later, it was time for Dre to go to college. Nicole had called off work to drive Dre to the airport. I just want to apologize one last time before you leave, Dre, Aunt Lauren said as Dre was preparing to leave. Marcus should have never done that. It's in my rear view now, Aunt Lauren, Dre said. I'm focused on school now. She gave him a hug and a kiss. When he got outside, he noticed his dad standing outside the house. You ready, son? Rich questioned. Of course, Dre responded. Rich asked Dre to stay out of trouble, gave him a hug and a handshake. I'll follow you guys to the airport because I got to catch a flight back to St. Louis today, Rich said as he started to head towards a taxi parked on the curb. The summer was over. Dre made it out alive. He was finally in the passenger seat of his mom's car about to head to the airport. He had never been to California, so he was excited to explore a new scenery. He learned a lot from the summer. Dre learned that loyalty could save your life. The fact that Red noticed Dre was so loyal is one of the reasons why he testified. It was one of the reasons Marcus was caught lying. In the end, Rich ended up getting a job on the outskirts of St. Louis as a janitor at a warehouse. He stayed away from drinking and steered his focus towards saving to help Dre invest in his future business idea. Nicole was promoted at her job in Indiana, so she got a house there. Aunt Lauren helped Marcus's girlfriend take care of his daughter. She continued working her job, but she moved to an apartment on the south side of Indianapolis. Tea, sports, and drinks were shut down after Bo's death. No one wanted to take care of it due to how much of a bad reputation it gained after Bo died. Red continued to reside in the same neighborhood. He was not aware yet, but Dre planned to help him get on his feet someday. In the meantime, he just needed to sit back and enjoy his college life in California. Closing credits. This has been Counterfeit, the Dre Owens story, written by Amir Dozier, recorded in AOE Recording Studios in Fort Worth, Texas, narrated by Ty Macklin, copyright 2020 by Amir Dozier Production, copyright by Amir Dozier.